Well, hello and welcome back to Benefits TV. I'm your host, Christine Glazman, and we have a little bit uh, different kind of content we're going to share today. I have the exclusive privilege of getting to interview successful leaders from our local community. And today I'm joined by Chris Vaccaro with Capstone Financial, and we're going to learn some golden nuggets from his success journey. So Chris, thank you so much for taking the time out today to share with us. Um, please, before we um, launch into our questions, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your firm. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. You said Capstone Financial. That's the name of my business. This is our 20-year uh, anniversary. <clears throat> I started the business, let's see, May of 2002. Wow. So you're catching me right on my 20th anniversary. And uh, I'm uh, a product of California. I grew up in the Central Valley uh, near Visalia in a little small agricultural town called Woodlake. But I did go to Sacramento State and got my degree there. And I was a swimmer and enjoyed college sports and some su success there. Then moved back home to Central California, fell in love, got married. And my wonderful wife, Kim, of 32 years, we have four kids together, grown, grown children and one daughter-in-law. Yay! Grown children, emphasis on grown children. And one daughter-in-law, no grandkids yet. And we came back to the area uh, and lived near Placerville. We came back to the area in 2001. And, uh, and at that time is when I got going on building Capstone Financial Group. Awesome. Um, tell us a little bit more about, so every, every business has a journey and evolution um, from, from where it started. So tell us a little bit more about that. And I certainly have, for sure. Um, what I have today and where I started, it's been a journey. Um, when I got done with college, uh, it, that was 1989. That was a very different world than we live in mm -hmm. today. And uh, well, I graduated in 87, moved back to the Central Valley, as I said, and I got married in 89. But when, when I launched my career, so to speak, um, I accidentally got into the financial services business. And that's the truth. I was thinking that I would go into business somewhere. My folks were encouraging me to work in like the school system, become a teacher. Um, and the truth is when you're just a kid trying to figure things out, you don't always know what you want to do. But I had a, um, I, I was coaching swimming. I, I was had a lot of success in swimming. I had a private swimming lesson business and I was coaching and, but I was realizing that, you know, becoming a professional swim coach is probably not uh, the greatest occupation unless you're going to work for the Olympic team or something. So I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And when I, I, you know, came across a lot of people in that, in that uh, business, because I was around a lot of kids and I had a family that was really influential and a gentleman, in fact, the grandpa of the kids that I was uh, teaching swimming was a very successful New York life agent uh, selling life insurance and financial services for New York life in the Fresno area. I didn't know what New York life was. Heck, you know, I was a kid still trying to figure out. But he said, you know what, Chris, you need to talk to the general manager up in Fresno and find out about this career. I said, you know, OK. So I went to this interview and, you know, I'm wearing like old Dockers, some tie I borrowed from my dad and, you know, some shirt that didn't fit me. And these guys at New York Life are like really dressed up, very professional, a very quality group. And I was like a little bit, you know, I was in deep water. I was a little bit out of my league feeling. But anyway, over a series of interviews, I actually felt like, wow, I've stumbled into something that could be a great fit for me. I love working with people. I love uh, talking, as you can tell. And I love business and I love planning and thinking about the economy, the markets, and how it all fits together. And so I accidentally got hired by New York Life. And that launched me on this journey to Capstone Financial Group today. So let me give you the short version. I worked for New York Life for uh, six years. I was their rookie of the year in the Central Valley office. 
I got featured in a national brochure for New York Life that went out to every New York Life office in the country talking about it's a great career opportunity. Look at this guy in California, how well he did. And that was a real honor because I got to meet the chairman of the board and everything. But in, in uh, 2005, 2006, I, I, excuse me, 19, I got to go a decade earlier, 1995 and 1996, I really started thinking I'd really like to have my own brand, my own business. New York Life's a great company. They have a big focus on life insurance, great quality company, but I really like to have my own brand. And as I begin to develop that thinking, uh, I'd be a little more independent. I started putting plans in place to start my own business and move away from the New York Life. So in 96, I started a company called Valley Financial Group, Central California. We had an office in Visalia. And I hired several uh, other people I knew from the industry. So it was a group of about four of us that were more focused on financial planning. And I hired my first employee then. That's the first time I had to make payroll for somebody. And we began to follow a process uh, that was more financial planning, more planning driven than it was just product sales. Um, that company did well. Now, I didn't know how to be a business person. I was learning and figuring it out. And, and you know, because uh, not I, I was a pretty good planner, but actually running the business was a new thing for me. So leases, employees, insurances, advertising. In those days, there wasn't a lot of internet, you know. So I was learning all that stuff. And I had an opportunity in uh, 2001 to merge my company with a Sacramento firm, I got I got kind of recruited from a, a, an ex New York Life person that I knew to come back to Sacramento and be a partner. And I thought, and my wife and I thought about the opportunity. I thought, you know what? I, I think this is a great opportunity, and that brought us up to Sacramento again, and we, we relocated and uh, been here ever since. Now, side note: that opportunity was a terrible business mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was uh here's a little pearl of wisdom for anybody if you're gonna have a partner make sure you like each other and they think the same way you do otherwise you're just getting into trouble because i was the minority partner and when i got involved with this partnership uh it was a lot, a lot bigger company which i was excited about but uh he wasn't a great leader and people were already leaving us and that's what led to me leaving and starting my brand today, Capstone Financial Group. It was that bad business decision of being in a partnership. So let me pause there. I gave you, that was my practically my life history, Christine. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, so my next question is, and I'm sure this has changed over time, but uh, you know, every everyone, every business owner has something that gets them out of bed in the morning, beating the alarm clock, so to speak. Yeah. And you know, I didn't include this in my original question, but I'd actually like to know what motivates you now, and maybe how has that changed? Like, was it different earlier on in your journey? Yeah, it was. I left that partnership. And now uh, I'm in Sacramento and I'm trying to think, okay, we've got to move back to our hometown and restart Valley Financial Group because I'm really scared at this point. So one of my motivations was, oh my gosh, I'm a, I got a family to take care of. I've got to figure something out. So I remember talking to my wife about, hey, this thing's not going to work out in Sacramento. We, we maybe need to move back and Here's my motivation. She said, um, honey, uh, I, I don't care what you need to do. You need to talk to uh, what you need to figure out, but we're not moving back. I love Placerville and so do the kids. The schools are great. We're staying here. And so that's when my motivation started <laughs> like a slap in the face, like gulp. <laughs> I better figure something out. So I was very motivated to for a second time, launch a new brand and start uh, my own business, Capstone Financial Group. 
The problem was Capstone Financial Group wasn't really a group at that time. It was one person only. Okay. And so my motivation was I need to find clients and I need to get to work right away so that my family and I can stay in this area and a new market for us and build something uh, and, and uh, make a success, make a business success here so we can raise our family here. That's what motivated me. I was getting out of bed scared. Okay. Mm. My first office was in Shingle Springs. It was just a little one room Capstone Financial Group office. Um, and that really motivated me. And I got off to a quick start. Why? I actually did some things smart without, without really, uh, I can't claim to be smart, but I did some smart things. One, I was really motivated to make friends and be involved in the community. Mm -hmm. And I like, I like helping and, and uh, seeing, seeing people other than me, seeing people succeed. And that was one of my motivations. So I got involved with church. I got involved with the community. I got involved with a business networking group. I got involved helping to coach the high school swim team. And I plugged in right away. And so the motivation of fear launched me. But today, my motivation is completely different, completely different, because fast forward 20 years, we have a large office here in Folsom. We've got uh, advisors in Idaho, Washington, Southern California. Uh, we're a fairly large group. And now my motivation is to serve as many people as possible helping them build wealth and make good decisions. Um, my motivation is helping other advisors to build their career because part of what I do is coaching other advisors to uh, do things like I did. And um, I'm motivated by leaving a legacy. You know, I want my company brand, Capstone Financial, I want to be able to drive by the building 20 years from now and go, hey, that's my company that I started. And, and look at them now, they're, they're doing well. That, so that's what motivates me today. A little different than, um, you know, I just needed to buy hot dogs and uh, school, you know, shoes for school, which, you know, 20 something years ago. That, that's what was my driver then. That makes sense? <laughs> Absolutely, that's fantastic. It sounds like you, you've had a really solid support system um, on your whole journey um, besides your family immediate family, were there some other people that came alongside you uh, in your journey and encouraged and supported supported you? Um, and what did you learn from them? How did they provide support? Were there some other key players in there that helped you along the way? Yes. Um, that's a great question because it's so helpful to have other people that have walked this path before come alongside and help you out. And sometimes they need to kick you in the butt a little bit. Sometimes they just need to kind of say, hey, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You're going to get through it. Sometimes it's nice to get a pat on the back from somebody you really respect. And they say to you, hey, you're doing great. And then that fires you up like, wow, if they say that, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. So yeah, there were, there were definitely uh, people in the community and people I was... Um, uh, let's say associated with nationally, I joined this emeritus network. Okay. And this emeritus group, which I'm still part of today has been very, very important to me. Um, emeritus is based in Lincoln, Nebraska, and their roots are, uh, you know, 150 year old mutual insurance company that developed into a financial services company and investment wealth management, financial planning company. And I'm part of that family nationally. Um, I'm not their employee. I affiliate with them so I can use their services as a broker dealer and a registered investment advisor. So I have tons of friends around the country that have similar businesses. And I've got involved in a study group with other similar business people to me. I've had various people from the leadership of Emeritus uh, encourage me and help me over the years. Uh, with advice, uh, business planning, basics. Uh, I've had uh, encouragement and recognition. One of the things that I think motivates me more than money is to feel like I'm doing something. 
mm -hmm. doing, making a difference and doing something good. And the recognition I've gotten nationally uh, has been motivating for me. So those kind of people from business and then personally, uh, people from my church, uh, people from the community have been uh, very, very motivating and also been good friends as I've built my business over time. I think that's really a key point for anybody that's in business or uh, anybody that is uh, needing support is you got to get plugged in with other people. You can't get supported just sitting around by yourself. Absolutely. Great, great question. That's fantastic. Were there some key pivotal moments in your business that brought you greater success? Can you, looking back, are there some experiences, some things that uh, you know caused a pivot? And many times we experience that, and as business owners, that will inspire us, give it, give us a boost of confidence. Like, yes, I'm on the right track here. Um, do you have any any experience you could share on that topic? I have about 50 I could share. <laughs> Pick the one that stands out the most. Let me give you a few. Let me give you a few that have made a difference. Okay. Um, if you think about what I do, I help uh, individuals and business owners put together a financial plan to make sure that they, they can meet their goals. And everybody's a little different, but most of those plans involve building wealth, distributing wealth over time in retirement and protecting wealth through insurance. And so I've had some very motivating moments. Like I've had several aha moments. And um, one of those was early in my career, I was working with a guy who, uh, a friend of the family who owned a big dairy, multi-million dollar dairy in the Central Valley. And he was in his mid fifties and his children were about my age and they were, his son was coming into the dairy business and just getting going. And uh, the mother wasn't involved in the business. Um, and the daughter had a different career, two kids. And this gentleman and I worked together trying to put together a financial plan for him. Well, it was tough because he, he was a, um, a little out of my league is what I'd say. He's, you know, his, his check each month from his milk uh, from the dairy was over 200,000 a month. And I was thinking, wow, he's, he's already wealthy. Well, he did. He had a lot of wealth and he had a lot of cash flow, but it was going through the dairy business, which is very expensive also and has a lot of costs. Okay. What he didn't have was a lot of cash and he didn't really have other investments. And so what I did is I worked with him to get a plan to uh, build up uh, the goal was to get three, four million dollars separate where he could either use that to buy additional real estate to, to, to grow the dairy or use it for additional retirement income if he wanted to sell the dairy. One of the things I also did is I, I said, your son can't run this dairy right now. Uh, he's getting there, but he can't run it right now. And your wife's not interested in running it. It's not her thing. I, I said, what happens to you? What are you going to do with uh, 500 cows and you know 200 acres and all this? if something were to happen to you. He goes, I don't know, they'll figure it out. <laughs> so I convinced him to buy a $3 million life insurance policy as part of our plan. It's like, if you don't live long enough to build this money up, we're gonna get life insurance in place that does it instantly. Well, he did that. And fortunately for the family and very unfortunately for him, he was involved in a car accident right at the front of his dairy, right on the street outside his house and was killed. Mm. And that was a year and a half after I put that policy in place. Wow. And when I got that phone call that he had died, I was floored. I, I felt such a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. and Like it was an, oh my gosh moment. What are we going to do? Well, the good news is I brought that check to the family. We got a partnership set up between mom and the son. That extra cash helped them get through some adjustment times. And today they have a very successful business, now 100% owned by the son. 
and mom is set up and in good shape. And that was a motivating aha moment for me that just shook me and changed my career because I realized, wow, the advice I'm giving people about their money, about their insurance, about how to fit all these pieces together was actually pretty darn critical. It wasn't just a joke. It was real. And I, that was a very motivating moment for me where I began to take my work a lot more seriously. Not that I didn't before that, but that was a very convicting moment about the importance of financial planning and insurance and fitting all that together to make sure that you have a good plan. So that really changed my career, that moment. Mm -hmm. And it made me a better financial advisor. Um, it almost brings tears to my eyes even to think about that moment. And that was 25 years ago. So that was very, very motivating in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment in my career. Another quick one was I got into a bad partnership. And in a negative way, that was very motivating where I was thinking, I don't wanna be like this guy. I can't have him as a partner. This is not gonna be good for my reputation and what I wanna do and my ethics going forward. And that bad decision motivated me to get out and restart a company that did have the right ethics and the right motivation. That was number two. And probably number three, was recently I had a chance to uh, go to Lincoln, Nebraska and talk to the board of directors at Emeritus and give them a presentation about the importance of financial services companies and what they do for the public and why it's a big responsibility to have good programs good financial products and whatnot, because I'm having people use those in their financial plan, whether that's investments, uh, financial planning, annuities, life insurance, uh, 401k plans, whatever it is, I, I'm delivering that and putting my reputation on the line and depending on the company that builds it, whether it's Emeritus or Fidelity, Vanguard, or anybody else that builds it, I'm depending on them because I've pushed it forward and said, this is what you need to do, Mr. and Mrs. Client. And so it's me, my reputation. So that was a highlight of my career also, very motivating and very exciting to be able to speak at a high level to people that are the decision makers at a national organization like that. Okay, I'll take a breath. Take okay, a breath. yes, take a breath, take a drink of water if you need to do that. Um, yeah, my next question, I think you may have, you, I know, I think you've answered some of it, but, um, all of us, you know, in our, in our success journey as entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, we, we start in one place and then through all of our experiences and our growth and our success, a lot of times we'll have a change in perspective. Um, and even, uh, you know, we may usually have our, our basic characters formed, you know, by the time that we're an adult, but it can continue to evolve and really improve and be strengthened. Um, and, you know, we can have perspective changes on what we do. So my question was, how has this journey changed you for the better? Like, have you observed things in yourself that have um, personal growth? I guess that, that's my, my next question. Anything you haven't already shared? Well, I did, I, did share one, I did share one very big aha moment that made mm -hmm. me become a better professional. That'd be the way I would summarize that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I grew up uh, an oldest child. I had success in sports. Um, I thought it was kind of a big deal, you know, and I, it, 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 I, got, I got humbled a few times early in my mm -hmm. career, and I realized I'm not that really that big a deal. Um, just because you're an all-American swimmer, that doesn't really mean much in the real world. Whoopie yeah. do. You can't make a living as a swimmer unless you're uh, Olympic level. And um, I, so, so I, I have learned some things. One of the things I learned is that I originally wasn't very empathetic. Mm -hmm. So people would come in with a problem. And they'd be telling me about it. And I'd be like rolling my eyes like, oh, my gosh, what a whiner. Like, toughen up, you know, <laughs> toughen up a little bit. Like, suck it up and get through it. Gosh. And I realized that I wasn't very empathetic. That, you know, 
these are real problems that people are coming to me with and trying to get help with, you know, especially obviously in my business related to money. But this was in other parts of my life too, raising my kids, uh, things at church, things in the community. I was just going, come on, you know, toughen up. And I thought, I, I've learned now to be more empathetic, mm -hmm. to be understanding, to be really be a better listener and to understand, wow, this is really a barrier or they're really hurting or this is something that I need to help with them with instead of just being like eye roll, you know. Um, and part of that change has come because things have happened in my life that I had no control of that I couldn't, if I was looking at me and going, oh, come on, toughen up. Uh, I, that wouldn't have worked. For example, our second child was, 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 uh, we found out when our, when my wife was pregnant, our second child, Daniel, he was going to be born with a very seriously deformed heart. Mm. And he was likely not to live past two or three weeks. That's what we were told. Well, it's hard for me to look at my wife and say, come on, toughen up. Um, that was a moment that in my life where I was broken, like there was nothing I could do. And thank goodness the lady in our church brought us a book about Loma Linda, California, and the university at the hospital there, because Loma Linda pioneered infant heart transplants. What an amazing thing. And so through a series of events, we moved my wife to Loma Linda and got involved in that program. And uh, as time came for her to give birth, our son Daniel was born and was cared for in intensive care there. And amazingly, you know, when you, when you need a transplanted organ, that means somebody else has to die and give their organ. It's a, it's a gift of life, truly, right? Mm -hmm. Amazingly, uh, an organ was provided for my son. He was 10 days old, and a little baby back east passed away, and the parents were generous enough to donate mm -hmm. the organs. Wow. Loma Linda had a, a, local, a local company donate their jet. The, the doctors flew all night, harvested the organ is what they call it, flew all night back and first thing in the morning on the 10th day, put that heart into my son. Oh my goodness. He's 27 years old today, graduated mm -hmm. Sac State. He's working in downtown Sacramento. He's got a wonderful life. You know, he's, he's on track, he's doing well. Well, I learned that I don't always have control and I can't always just eye roll. And there's some things that, that so that helped me to be a different person today than I used to be. Yes. Maybe more empathetic and understanding, a little more humble and a little more um, uh, take, take the attitude of be a better listener and mm -hmm. approach problems a little differently because mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been through some things myself personally that just weren't, hey, toughen up yeah. uh, moments. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Looking back. Um, were there any things, the hindsight's always perfect, but um, looking back on your journey, were there any things in business or personal decisions that you might have done differently um, with the wisdom you have now? Um, if you haven't already shared something on that, is there anything you might have done differently? A couple of things come to mind. Mm -hmm. Um. One of the things I think I did is I was afraid early in my business career, I was kind of afraid to spend money on certain things. So how did that hurt me? Well, I would go cheap on an office space. Or I may not hire a really qualified person for a role I needed filled. I hired somebody that wasn't maybe qualified so I'd have a lower cost. But what happened? I ended up doing a lot of that work myself twice, you know, doing it over. And um, what happens when somebody comes to your office and it's, you know, it's not in a great spot or it's not doesn't have the image? It doesn't make your you look really credible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, looking back on things, I learned the hard way. I think it's important if you're in business, just hire the right person to work for you. 
-hmm. And that, that, I mean, that means don't go cheap, hire the right person because that's actually gonna save you money in the long run and make your clients happier. Mm -hmm. So today I do try and have a very high quality staff. That helps me to be more successful. And if you were a client of mine, I hope you'd say, hey, Chris has got a great staff. I always get my questions answered. I always get called back quickly. I'm always getting served well. You know, those are the things that I've learned through the school of hard knocks. So that, that would be one thing I'd put out there uh, as, a, as a, if a business owner is listening and they're thinking. The, the other thing is, um, I, I think it's important to be a giver. That's really helped me. If, if you can go and get involved in things, charities, community, church, uh, schools, and be a giver and a doer, that helps your community. And that uh, helps the world around you. And you know, a funny thing, you tend to get big business out of that too, because people look at you, even though that's not necessarily your motivation, that's one of the things that happens. Your reputation for being a giver and somebody who cares, that's kind of what people are looking for when they want to do business with somebody. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a, a good thought too, I would put out there as I, if people are listening to this and thinking about their own business. Those are some things that have really helped me or made a difference. And if I would have done that sooner or uh, been more involved, I think I would have, I'll add one more thing. My business has changed a lot over the years. The financial services business has really evolved. And um, a lot of people ahead of me were selling their businesses. And I, I didn't look at that as a real opportunity until maybe 10 years ago, I began to uh, purchase some retiring uh, advisors, some of their businesses. And I, that really helped me accelerate my growth because I found out there was a lot of people in that client base that were looking for younger, you know, uh, uh, good advice, new advice, some new thoughts. And they were anxious to meet with me and hear what I had to say. And I really accelerated my business growth and I should have done that 20 years before that. And I just did. So uh, those are a couple thoughts that come to mind on that question. Awesome. This is going to be my last question. Um, okay. What do you feel sets you apart from others in the same industry as you? Share a little bit about um, how you do things differently and what you do differently. Oh, gosh. Well, my COVID beard <laughs> really makes me stand out with my little gray flavoring here at the bottom. Um, one thing that I do, I feel like, is I really educate people on their options. And I make a complicated area and complicated topics uh, very simple to understand by by um, by the way I explain things. And I've been around a lot of people in my industry. I've been to conferences, I've been to meetings, I've and I've talked to a lot of clients. And one of the things that's chronic in the financial planning and financial services, wealth management industry is advisors that are trying to talk and sound really smart. So we want to use all the big words, you know, we want to use all all the big words when we're talking about the market and the economy or planning. And clients don't need the big words. Clients mm -hmm. need to understand and buy into what you're saying. Otherwise, they, they might walk out and say yes, but they don't feel good about it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think that sets us apart is being able to take complex things and make them understandable. And people then are in a position to make a good decision for their family or for their business. The only other thing I'd say is that I really care a lot about what I do. I really don't want to let people down. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that comes from. Probably from being a big brother or an oldest child. I've thought about it a lot. But I really put my own name on all the work I do. Mm -hmm. And I don't, want, I don't want three years from now or five years from now for that to be something that is where I let somebody down. So... 
I try really hard to make sure that we service and stay with that client very closely to make sure they're satisfied. And in a time and in the business I'm in, um, that's a challenge because <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the average portfolio, for example, right now we're talking on May 20th and the market's what down about 20% year to date. We had a couple good years prior to that, but in the last three years we had, or last four years, we had the end of 2018, a 20% slide. We had COVID hit in March of 2020. That was a 30% hit in the market. And now with inflation and some of our supply chain issues and some of the lack of confidence that people are having, we have about another 20% slide. So <clears throat> it's important for me to be a professional hand holder mm -hmm. through times like this and really support people so that we don't make bad decisions and jump all over the place, okay? Mm -hmm. And I care, it'd be really easy for me to just yank somebody out of something and put them in something different and when there's disruption in the markets, but we stick by what we set up. We make some minor adjustments and tweaks where necessary or if the person's situation has changed. But most often we know from looking at history and from looking at markets that these moments pass and the market over time, even though you might have five corrections in a 15 year period, typically the market will have double digit returns throughout if you hold. So being a professional handholder is also a really a difference maker that we, I think we provide. Is that actually a job, a professional handholder? Yeah, I think it is, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, people need, they need a continual reassurance when it comes yeah. to, to their money. That's um, a lot of our security is placed in that. So that's super important. Um, anything else you want to share before we wrap up here? Oh, I apologize. I do have one last question. What advice would you give entrepreneurs, maybe people in a similar industry as you, um, if they were just starting out? Well. In any industry, I don't care what it is, my advice would be, you know, make sure you have a passion for what you do. Be excellent at it. If you're gonna install doors, be the best and make sure you explain everybody's options to them so that they, they can choose what door they want. Mm -hmm. Or, or what, what, if, you're, if you repair things, if you build stuff, if you, if you sell things, whatever your business is, have a passion for really doing doing it well. That means being an expert in your field. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's important. Um, if you don't have that, you're not going to serve people that well. Okay. Second thing is don't just be motivated by money. Mm -hmm. Money, money is actually, everybody needs to make money and you need to have a successful business career. And obviously the result is, is money and, and uh, taking care of your family and your own financial plan. But if you're totally motivated by money, that can get in the way mm -hmm. of what we call in our office, we call best interest, mm -hmm. is what's in the best interest of the client? Mm -hmm. If you do that part right, whatever business you're in, then you're going to be successful mm -hmm. and you're going to make money. Yes. Okay? And um, if you are cutting corners or not quite telling the whole truth or whatever to get to the dollars, that's not gonna be a long-term success. You might have short-term success, but ultimately you're not gonna have repeat business and that's gonna hurt you. So whatever business you're in, that would be my advice. In this particular business, you need to be really educated. You need to follow things carefully with, and you need to have a lot of empathy and understanding for what your clients feel. Mm -hmm. And um, you need to be able to explain things in a way that people can understand and go, okay, I get it. And so here's my decision then based on that explanation. So being good at explaining things in a way that people can understand is what you need to work on if you're going to be in the financial services business. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Any uh any parting thoughts, anything else you wanted to share before we wrap up here? Uh, 
there's nothing more satisfying than having a successful business. I'll tell you, it, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it feels great. Uh, I know there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in Capstone Financial Group, and I, so I'm very satisfied with where we are today. But um, I can't take 100% credit for that myself, okay? A lot of people have helped me along the way. I've had a lot of good people I've been affiliated with, and even nationally, as I shared earlier, I have a lot of friends and support, and that, that's what's done it. And uh, luckily, I haven't stuck my foot in my mouth too many times or fallen in too many holes that I've been able to, to, to do this. And so today, now today I get it a lot more, and I understand business a lot better, and I understand what things I need to do to take care of people and grow my business. And so my last parting advice is if you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, you're growing your business, ask a lot of questions of other entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. get a lot of opinions. Don't be hard headed and think, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. Ask a lot of questions, say, you know, what do you think? What do you think? How, how, how can I bonus this employee better to make sure they stay with me? And yet it's not costing me a fortune. How do I balance that out? How, what's the best way to advertise? Um, what, what would you say? And those are all great questions. So I'd say ask a lot of questions and don't be hard headed. Mm -hmm. And people out there that are successful in business, a lot of th times they have great things to share uh, and will will happily give you ideas or share. And some of that stuff's going to stick and apply to your business. Yeah. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think that's okay. uh, don't be hard headed. <laughs> don't be a knucklehead. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Stage advice, don't be a knucklehead. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. This has been fantastic. Um, best way for people to reach you, capstonefinancial.net. Look you up, call you, email. Yep. Website, website. contact yep. form. Yep. Okay. Those are, all, those are all we're easy to find. We're in we're in Folsom as our main office, capstonefinancial.net. You'll find our phone numbers and contact information. My um, email is C, like my first name, Vaccaro, V-A, two C's, V-A-C-C-A-R-O, C Vaccaro at capstonefinancial.net if anybody wants to reach out. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up our webinar here. Thank you again so much for your time. My pleasure. Um, we look forward to seeing the awesome things you're going to continue to do for our community and all the people that you serve. So we thank you again, Chris. God, God bless. Will. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.